Good morning. It is the second Sunday of Easter. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Our theme this day is on witnessing and um, going out into the world as we are called by Christ to do. And uh, the scripture this day is somewhat of a, what I would call a second Easter. And uh, this is a quote by Jesse Middendorf. It is easier to live by lists of rules and laws than it is to live an authentic, dynamic, and redemptive relationship to people. Laws can be static and arbitrary. Jesus reached into the law to reveal its objective, the valuing and protection of others. So as we begin, worship this day and let us keep that in mind. A reminder that God is with you in all that we do this day and every day. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we receive the legacy of a living hope, born again not only from his death, but also from his resurrection. May we who have received forgiveness of sins through the Holy Spirit live to set others free. Until at length we enter the inheritance that is imperishable and unfading, where Christ lives and reigns with you and the same Spirit. Amen. Our first lesson comes from uh, the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter beginning with the 14th verse. I invite you now to listen to the Word of God. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourselves know, this man handed over to you, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hand of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you, O God, will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would be that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And of that all, and of that, all of us are witnesses. This is holy wisdom and holy words. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson comes to us from the gospel according to John, the 20th chapter beginning with the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. 
When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. My friends, this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is right after Jesus' resurrection, the celebration of Easter, when Mary went to the tomb, and depending on the Gospels, um, whether it's just Mary Magdalene, whether it's um, the Marys, whether it's multiple women, um, the Gospel that we read for Sunday last week speaks of Mary interacting with um, Christ, the risen Christ, and um, she is told to go tell the disciples what she has seen. No matter what, no matter what gospel we read, it is evident that Easter, the proclamation of Easter, that Christ is risen, and that we respond, Christ is risen indeed, it's an affirmation that yes, we believe that, yes, we hold that to be true, we've experienced this Christ in our own lives. Um, the disciples knew that Christ had risen, or knew something had happened that was out of the ordinary, that was not what they expected. And yet, in the midst of that, they find themselves scared and hiding behind locked doors. And they have much to be fearful of. Most of them are Galileans, and so their accent and their um, diction their word choice gives it away. So there's no way they can hide the fact that they are Galileans. And after all that had happened the week before, with the large parade, could be considered also a counter-protest, they are known, they are well known, and they fear that what has happened to their rabbi, their teacher, is going to happen to them. Because they stood with someone who stood against the religious authorities, those who had power, as well as Rome. And they knew that it was very realistic to think that they may be next. And so they are hiding. They're hiding in a room, and the door is not just shut, but it's locked. And this fear has overwhelmed them. And they can't figure out how they are supposed to go on living without their teacher, their leader, their Messiah. How do they continue in everyday life when all that gave them hope and did give them peace of mind and peace of heart, peace of soul, that it's gone? How do we, how do we change our lives overnight? I think we can identify with the disciples in some way on that on that level. Um, we went from 
being careful, washing our hands, to we are now sheltering in place. And if we go to the grocery store or wherever we go, we go because we have to, not because we want to. We find ourselves locked behind closed doors out of fear. And in the midst of that fear, Christ comes in to the disciples as well as Christ comes to us in this day and says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. May peace reside amongst you. May peace embrace you. May you embrace peace. There are those who are taking to the streets and saying that their liberty and their freedom is being, um, that they're being oppressed, that they are, that their rights are being um, trampled on. I believe that Christ in the midst of that, in the midst of our fears and stuff, still calls us to be at peace with our own lives and our own circumstances at this point. And it's not a generalization. I don't want to say that we should be at peace with everything that's in our lives. But that there has to be this understanding of how we reconcile our own peace with also the peace of others and bringing peace to our world. In fear, we do things that are not always rational. In fact, most of the time, we do things that are irrational. That little part of our reptilian brain that still exists, where we um, fight, flight, or freeze. When we're fearful, we choose one of those. We're either gonna fight against whatever uh, scares us, we're going to freeze because we just don't know what to do, i.e. our disciples hiding in a room, or we're going to flight, or we're going to fly, or take to flight and uh, run away from what we are afraid of. And in the midst of all that, Jesus comes to us and the disciples and says, peace be with you. So come to some understanding of how we're going to navigate what is the new reality. And when Jesus arrives and suddenly appears, the disciples are ecstatic. And there's much celebratory and uh, celebration and excitement and fears are relieved because Jesus has come to them in their locked room. Somehow Jesus was able to break or move beyond the physical barriers of a door and a lock. Before we get too excited, before the disciples had too, too much time to get excited about what had happened, that Jesus had, had appeared, is that Jesus says once again, peace be with you. And then he continues on saying, so as the Father has sent me, now I send you. I am sure there was a, a look of shock, a look of dismay. The fear that had been alleviated now came back tenfold. Because in that one sentence, as the Father has sent me, now I send you, the disciples are like, well, that means we have to unlock and then open the door and go outside. We actually have to experience other people, that we have to expose ourselves for who we are, for what we hold to be true. Then we proclaim you as Messiah, as Christ, as Savior, and that we will face the same, the same possible outcome as Jesus of Nazareth did. Death. Execution. By the powers that be. Because although the disciples are not Jesus, nor are they the risen Christ, they represent all that Christ was and is. 
and that makes other people fearful. And they are afraid. And I think there will be fear when finally the shelter in place and uh, some of the other precautions are slowly removed. I think we'll still be afraid. We'll still want to hide. We'll still want to remain behind shut, locked doors. And yet, Christ calls us in the midst of all of our fears to go forward. That we are sent. Not, not that we are, are just released out into the wild and said, here you go. But just as Jesus was sent out into the world to speak of God's compassion and mercy and love and grace, of forgiveness. But that message was not supposed to end with the physical life or the, or the earthly life of Jesus. That even after death, the cosmic Christ is still calling out to the disciples at that moment, Christ's disciples now, at this moment, to go as we have been sent to go out into the world, to preach um, love, acceptance, and that we are to recognize sin for what it is in our own lives and how we can make our lives better and how we reflect that out in the world so that the world can see Christ in us. And yes, with that comes fear. Are we going to be accepted? Are people going to reject us? Are our friends going to uh, unfriend us on Facebook? Are they going to block our emails? Are they going to block our phone calls? Because we have all that, we have, technologically, we have been able to block out whoever we choose. We can block out people from our lives quite easily. No solicitation sign outside your door. You can block a phone number, a text on your phone. You can unfriend someone and block them on Facebook. Folks, if we choose to, we can lock ourselves away. Or we can embrace the life that we have been given. That abundant life that Jesus was willing to cause such an uprising that it threatened the powers of the world enough that they felt they had to get rid of him. Are we willing? To embrace that call. Are we willing to say, you know what? There is peace of mind and, and a, a peace in our souls when we are going out, living our lives to the fullest, and doing so, reflecting the beauty and the love and the image of God in all that we are. Because when they are sent out, when they are sent out, and we are told that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. And yes, in between what I started out with and what I just said, there's a huge part dealing with Thomas. I think Thomas gets a bad rap. 
We always refer to Thomas as doubting Thomas. Um, we use that phrase, that colloquialism, to refer to someone who is always skeptical and doesn't believe and isn't willing to take um, others' words for it, that, wants, that he wants to experience what others have experienced so that he can embrace it and then live it and then be able to share it. So when the, when the other disciples are saying, we have seen the Lord, Thomas is like, great, I need to. I need to experience this risen Christ. Is that such a bad thing? Is that such a bad thing? You know Thomas had the same fears as everyone else. And yet the others had also been told that just as Christ had been sent, so they had been sent, and yet they're still a week later in the same room with the door shut. So before we're too critical of Thomas, let's realize that the other disciples had not changed anything. They had been told that they were sent, that they had been given authority and power as disciples to be used to the betterment of society, to the betterment of people, to sharing the good news, and they were still in hiding. And so Jesus appears again, again says, peace be with you, And Jesus tells Thomas, you know what? Right here, touch. Right here, touch. See. See what you need. Experience what you need to experience of me. And what didn't happen the week before happened with Thomas's experience of this risen Christ. My Lord and my God. And Jesus asks a question, do you believe because you have seen me? Which I think is a rhetorical question. But I don't think it's necessarily attributed to Thomas as much as it is the other disciples who are hiding in this room and were like, listen, you've seen me. You saw me a week ago. I sent you out into the world and to do so boldly. And what I get, I come back. I understand Thomas's doubts. I understand Thomas's struggles. But you, what are you doing here? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. So the disciples are called to a very difficult task. They're called to reflect the Christ in their own lives that other, may, other people may see this Christ. Because they're not going to have the opportunity to experience this risen Christ in the way that the disciples have. It's a tall order. It's a huge undertaking. even for the disciples who had experienced Christ face to face. The risen one, the living one. And that challenge for us has gotten no easier. We are still called. We are still sent. We are still encouraged with the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what Christ promised us, so that we would be able to fulfill that call. How will we answer that call? 
How do we undergird our fears of the unknowns, of the desire to always be liked, the desire to always be, be seen as as what others would like us to be, not who we really are. To embrace ourselves and all of our shortcomings. And know that the God who created and, and is still creating sent us a human manifestation of all that God is. And that that manifestation is to leave a mark on our own lives. So that we are compelled, that we are drawn out. That we accept the challenge, the call. It doesn't mean we don't have doubts. It doesn't mean we won't have fears. Jesus didn't criticize Thomas. Jesus didn't criticize the disciples. Jesus said, I was sent. Do you not think I didn't have fears? That I didn't, that I didn't want other options? We know scripture, scripture offers us agony in the garden, asking for plan B. And Jesus stick, stuck with plan A. May our fears not control us. May our fears, may our fears not prevent us from living. May we find hope. May we find peace. And we may have to remind us every day that Christ stands in our midst and says to each one of us, it is he with you. Amen. I'd like us to enter a time of prayer. Um, during this time of prayer, um, we're going to have some silence. And um, in that silence, I encourage you to, um, for those who actually have a keyboard in front of you, um, in the remarks, go ahead, <clears throat> go ahead and add your prayer requests. What I ask is that you use only first names and maybe a last name initial, but that's it. Or you can be as, as uh, vague as you wish to be, God knows. God knows what we're, what we're asking. So, um, so that we can be in prayer together. And for this week, we can add our prayers to our, our prayer, our own prayer requests. And that uh, the prayers that we offer may be multiplied in God's presence. <laughs> oh God, the the risen Christ remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors. As Christ's disciples in this age, we offer our prayers on behalf of the universe in which we are privileged to live. And our neighbors, although distant at the moment, with whom we share it. So oh God, we offer this day prayers for Kelly T and her family as they are grieving the loss of, of a mother, a grandmother, an aunt. May they find comfort and hope. We pray for those who are our first responders, 
to continue to work tirelessly to care for the physical well-being and health of their neighbors even when it is not safe they truly have embraced their calling and they're not afraid well maybe they are afraid but their calling their calling comes through stronger we give thanks to god for those who continue to work and drive through windows in kitchens so that we aren't stuck cooking our own food all the time. We pray for those, O oh God, who have been lost to this virus and also, O oh God, to the many things that plague humankind this day. For the family members who were not able to be present. For just like Thomas, oh God, we know what it feels like to have other people share an experience that we were not privileged to experience ourselves. Prayers of thanksgiving, O oh God, that all, although sheltering in place may be hard, we must be grateful and thankful that we have somewhere to shelter in place, that we have a home. We have a place that we call home. Surrounded by our things, our people, our pets, that we have a patio, a backyard in which to go outside and enjoy the beauty of nature. O oh God, in the silence, let us offer our own prayers to you. to your power moving around us and between us and within us and to your glories revealed in your love of both friend and enemy in communities transformed by justice and compassion and in the healing of all that is broken. Giving is an act of faith. We believe that what we have to offer makes a difference in this world. But more than that, we believe in the one who is behind our giving. We may not see God with these eyes of flesh. We may find it difficult to even catch a glimpse of what God may be doing around us and in us. Likewise, we may not see the effect of what we give or what we do for Christ but still we believe, trusting in the one who is faithful, whose new mercies we often can only see by faith, day by day. Operatory is, is um, our offering is part of most um, services. And I'm not asking for you to 
I mean, I'm not asking for your stimulus, stimulus check, folks. But I think we have the opportunity as God's people to show our love for our neighbor by doing what we can. Call that local restaurant, that local restaurant that's in your neighborhood, that's in your town, whatever, and if they are packaging food to go, buy a meal. If you are a seamstress, I should say a sewer, make some masks. I can guarantee that you know someone who quilts and they have material. According to my quilters here, it multiplies in the dark like Tribbles did in the original Star Trek show. So you can find some. I'm sure they got some elastic hidden away too. Give it your time. Spend some time calling folks and oh my gosh, if they can do FaceTime or something with some video, do it. People are starving to have that one-on-one -on -one time. And if you do belong to a religious community or community of faith, there are still bills to be paid. But let us find somewhere and some way and somehow to give of what we have that we may better those around us. Let us pray. Living God, long ago, faithful women proclaimed the good news of Christ's resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love is deep, and our faith is true. I'm going to invite us into a time of, as we share in the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, the Jesus Prayer. And I ask that uh, you recite it in the way that you know best, in your first native tongue, however you want to do it. Let us pray. Our Maker, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. The blessings of God who created us be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. The love of the Holy Spirit be with you. That although we have fear, not just in this time, but in times past and times that will come in the future, that we will still hear the Christ say in the midst of that dark place, peace be with you.